Hello guys, welcome back to a new episode of this series, The Iconic Style of X. Um, if you are new here, and you probably are since my channel is still very young, uh, my name is Astelia and I make videos about fashion, from high fashion to alternative to everything in between. Today's video is about the goth icon of the 80s, Suzy Sue. As always, I'm gonna take you on a journey throughout the context and history of the style, because fashion isn't only about aesthetic, it's about communicating your belief and your place in the world, and I find that so fascinating about it. First of all, I think it's fair to acknowledge that while being called the Queen of Goth, Suzy never liked that label, and her music is better referred to as post-punk. Yet she was really involved at the beginning of the gothic movement, and her influence on it can't be denied. So this is the angle I'm going to take in this video. She started her journey being part of the entourage of the Sex Pistols. Even back then, she was known for her, her dark, glam look and was part of a whole group of eccentric kids who were following the band around. She eventually distanced herself from the punk movement when it became mainstream and she felt it had lost its meaning. It was also the opportunity to focus solely on her own music. The name of the band, Suzy Sue and the Banshees, come from the 1970 movie Cry of the Banshees, a film about a witch set in Elizabethan England which gives you a cue on the aesthetical atmosphere the band was going for, right at the essence of goth, mixing horror and the romanticized past together with a good dose of esotericism. In 1977, the band started its first tour and the success happened quite fast despite the initial struggle to find a record label that was willing to sign them. Many people were struck by how different the music sounded. The album followed each other with critical acclaim, going from one genre to another but keeping a unique signature style. About her lyrics, she said, Damage lives, damage souls, damage relationships. Most of the damage I sing about happened when I was younger and I'm still feeling of it and working it out. Early experiences are what create a lifetime of damage. The song you write can help you fix the damage. A unique style quickly inspired the youth who began copying her and thus the goth style was born. She hated that though and about that she said, what I really resent the most about people sticking labels on you is that it cuts off all the other elements of what you are because it can only deal with black and white, the cartoon. She never wanted to be limited to one label, wanted to carve her own path with a mesmerizing self-confidence and strength which inspires entire generations to this very day. Now a bit of context about 80s fashion. Fashion-wise, the 80s was all about the big, expansive and loud elements which you can see in the way the trend favored big hair, intense makeup, colors, patterns and shapes. It was all about excess in one form or another. Some styles were more prone to it than others, and while some favored neon or pastel colors, others went the opposite way towards a black monochrome look. However, regardless of the style, I think there's a maximalist undercurrent that links them together and defines the decade, especially when compared to those that followed. When it comes to non-alternative styles, we all have in mind the stereotype of the 80s businesswoman with a masculine tailored suit with massive shoulders pad and high waisted trousers. Connected to that were the yuppies who were pretty much an 80s version of the old man aesthetic, mixing neutral with pastel colors that were so trendy at the time. The 80s were a time of increasing economic divide between the classes and people either wanted to dress the part to elevate their social standing or showcase which class they were part of to distance themselves from the masses. Politically, they embraced the capitalist individualistic mindset of everyone for themselves and the race toward more and more profit for a selected group of people, and were really supporters of the right-wing political figures that were in power at the time, such as Thatcher and Reagan. Of course, on the other side of things, many young people disagreed with these views and wanted to do things differently, which translated into a different taste in music and clothes. Alongside the goths were the new romantics, which I really hope to make a video about at some point because I love this style, the heavy metal style and the indie rock crowd which leaned more towards numcore, as we would say today. Goth had that deep desire to distance themselves from what was popular and I will discuss that in the next chapter. The goth subcultures emerged at the end of the 70s in England, following the decline of the punk movement that ended up being absorbed into the mainstream and had lost its purpose and meaning. The youth were seeking out another way to describe the distress of politics and society and were eager to find a new sound that felt more honest and real. At its core, the gothic aesthetic is about an attraction to the macabre, to what inspires fears and disgust and depart from the norm, 
seeking the taboos and unspoken themes that lies at the edge of society, diving right into the topic of death and unleash practices. Another way to describe it is dark romanticism. Androgyny was also a big part of it, and people sought to blur the barrier between genders in order to forge identities that transcended them. They also wanted to create safe spaces for all genders and identities at a time when those things were even more shunned than they are now, and when not everyone had the word to define them. It's no wonder one can find many not-so-subtle hints to esotericism and distorted symbols of Christianity, People were questioning the cultural and religious background and seeking a very direct way to break free from it by subverting it, exploring different ideas and worldviews. The root of modern goth obviously goes back to gothic literature with the work of authors such as uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Mary Shelley and Bram Stoker. But it also draws inspiration from the pre-Raphaelites who gravitated toward mythology, mysticism and death, the surrealist and the Dadaist, who share that fascination for combining conflicting elements together and embracing the chaos of the, of the psyche. However, you can find proto-goth icons that predate the movement by one or two decades, such as the Velvet Underground, Nico with her following's false solo career, Alice Cooper, glam rock icon, David Bowie, and so on. So the style didn't emerge out of nowhere, but I don't think it ever does, and it goes back much deeper than we think. Death chic is a way to describe this attraction to the macabre, to the corpse-like paleness and the thin, sickly bodies, this allure of mortician inherited from the Victorian era, the attraction to unhealthiness at a time when everyone was discovering aerobics and aiming at a curved, healthy figure. Here is a quote from the book Goth, the Undead Subculture. Goth fashion was and remains a mix and match melange of black and retro garments, fashioned from leather, buckles, velvet, silk, PVC, chains or lace. Goth may wear spiked heels, pointy-toed lace, shiny tight high boots, or clunky dog martins. They may accessorize with sunglasses, top hats, capes, corsets, cravats, ringing crops, or lunchbox purses. They may dye their hair black, white, red, or purple, and wear it back combed, teased, shaved, crimpled, or spiked. Goth may sport tattoos, body painting, piercing pur- purple contact lenses, fangs, or decorative scarring, Applying their makeup, they may flavor white face, mascara, eyeliner, kabuki-inspired face paint or red, black or purple lipstick, and nail polish. Goth fashion may incorporate elements of ancient Celtic, Christian, pagan, Egyptian or Asian iconographies. The overall style of an gothic ensemble may evoke high chic, antique, retro kitsch, punk fetish, second-hand trash or some combination of the above. As you can see, the Goth catalogue is pretty rich and allows for a lot of self-experimentation within its frame. This is probably why it has lived for so long, and why every community on the various continents have their own spin to it, and why there are so many subcategories. Susie Styles falls into the Trad God category, the one that emerged in the 80s and from which all other derives. You will notice the extreme hair, which is very different from the 80s haircut, Yet you will still find similarity in the excessive volume that was found in other styles as well. I want to dive a bit deeper into this attraction to the macabre and taboo that defines the goth movement, especially when it comes to women and their search for empowerment. In the article, which is Bitches and Fluids, girl bands performing ugliness and resistance by Karina Eliras in 1997. The author defines ugliness as a way to define an intentional deviation from the usual feminine qualities such as nice, pretty, and gentle when describing the way a girl of a woman looks, behaves, and talks. The author explains how this ugly way of presenting oneself was first pushed by the punk of the early 70s who embraced the chaos and violence present in one's mind and heart as a way to fight against the establishment and social norms. Susie herself said, People forget the punk thing was a really good thing for women. It motivated them to pick up a guitar rather than be a chanteuse. It allowed us to be aggressive. Karina Eliras also notes that many bands use the word bitches, witches and whores, these anonymous figures of history who were reclaimed as symbols of insurrection. The subversions of symbols of conventional feminine beauty, such as diamonds, perfume bottles and lipstick, were also often used and mixed with aggressive imagery as a way to carve out a path through the rotten world of patriarchal expectation, and as she writes, the surrealist juxtaposition creates a visual economy that emphasizes the violence to and alienation from the body 
that obedient performances of pretty and femininity entails. Nothing is ever just about the aesthetic. Start and graphic imagery serves a purpose. In this case, the search of an impact to blast to what one is expected to do by those who hold power of a woman's body. A fight that is far from being over in many parts of the world. The body shatters, disintegrates, as written in the song Christine. And this extreme change of form is expressed through the distressed clothes, but also through the use of various masks as a way to distort one's identity. The author continues, Kate Bush, Susie Suze and Annie Lennox are potent selves par excellence. They sort through history and mythology, trying out costumes, props and personas in order to confront gender boundaries as well as their own point of dissolution. The vamp, the witch, the dominatrix are all archetypes used by Susie to subvert these expectations. Of course, part of it is just about having fun and uh, have a pointful impact, but I think there are layers of meaning under that. It's a way of expanding boundaries of one's self. And by doing so, it opens the gate for other people to experiment with their appearance and express their thoughts and feelings. If you want to know more about the witch aesthetic, I have a whole video about it. But basically, the witch is all about the otherness, that space in between worlds, states and identities. And thus, it is a fertile ground for creative urges and a symbol of personal transmutation on many different levels. Again, we find a strong desire to express taboos and hidden aspects of society. It's not necessarily a conscious act, but rather stems from one's own emotion and taste. In her own words, Susie said, I think a certain amount of anger has been a fuel of mine, if you want, but also some sort of sadness and plain mischief, of course. The word mischief is really interesting to me. There is this idea of wanting to mess around with people and playfulness, which sometimes border on being totally inappropriate in Susie's case. In the book chapter Dark Admissions, The Gothic Subcultures and Ambivalence of Misogyny and Resistance, the author Joshua Gunn writes, Gothic style is consciously flamboyant and playful. It is mindful, performative gesture in which liberation is thought to be achieved through a display of ironic indifference. The theatrical ironic stance, which I call Gothic performativity, is central to those stylistic practices that Goths believe are too culturally resistant. Again, we find that very 80s idea of overwhelming the senses with visual excess, but also a seemingly contradictory detachment. It might be a response to the overly optimistic spirit of the 80s that pushed an excess of enthusiasm, which of course wasn't shared by the youth who struggled to find hope and meaning. In that regard, performing indifference and hopelessness, embracing the otherness, seems like a logical step to take. So I think by now you should have an idea of what goth looks like, so I'm gonna focus on Susie's most iconic looks now. It isn't going to be a surprise to anyone, but Susie was really famous for carbon black, eagle-like black eye makeup. It really helped highlighting her intense gaze, and it must have been so hypnotizing to see her in person or on stage. There's an abundance of black that goes up to the eyebrow and frames the entire orbit. It also sort of looks inspired from the ancient Egyptians' makeup, Again, on brand with the gothic attraction for ancient things, esotericism and religion. From afar, it kind of looks like a pale skull with empty eyes looking in your direction, which I guess was the goal. The lips were kept very small and defined, either black or red. Clothes wise, there's obviously an abundance of black, but I also found quite a lot of red, a color that is both striking and bloody, perfect for the goth look. Furthermore, you will find many textures we still find in the goth wardrobe today such as lace, as seen on these three amazing looks, you will notice there is a very revealing quality to them, even some bondage elements as seen on the right one. We can clearly see the historical antique vibe she's going for there, but it's completely modernized and turned to the extreme by the cut and the fact that it's figure hugging. The fact that the third look seems like it's falling apart it's also, is also kind of macabre in a way, as well as being definitely witchy. Of course, these days it's very common to see people dressed like that, but back then, it was very fresh and new. Leather was and still is also a staple of the gothic wardrobe. Here we can really see the androgynous vibe that was going on at the time. It's aggressive due to the military connotation, the shoulders are broad and the allure is striking. There is also this look I find absolutely iconic. Again, a very masculine military cut paired with a shiny satin top and skirt as some very gothic accessory in the literal sense of the word. These three looks have a folkloric vibe to them. It came at a time where she was trying to reinvent them herself, 
while still keeping the same heart to her personal style. You can find these dressed cut out elements and they are very witchy. In this one as well, the last picture especially, gives you a very witch vibe and she looks like she is entrancing the crowd. Lastly, the accessorization was very important as you wanted to pile as many necklaces, earrings and rings as possible. It was in line with the decade but done in a goth way, with an antique vibe and religious symbols. Pearls that are coded as rich purple jewelry could be used as a way to deviate their meaning. That's it for this video, subscribe if you want to see more, and see you next time!